The View, Church of the Larger Fellowships, uh, just amazing viral show about important topics in Unitarian Universalism. Today we have two special amazing guests and we are going to be talking about social justice coordination in UU congregations and they are staff that are um, hired to coordinate social justice efforts. So that'll be super exciting to talk about. And I'm, I didn't say who I am yet. I'm Aisha Hauser and I'm in Seattle, Washington. And we have sunny days upon us. Last week it was the gray days, but like I said, they really don't last. Don't believe anybody in Seattle who tells you that you never see the sun. So that's me, Michael Tino, how are you? Good morning, everyone. Uh, joining you from Peekskill, New York, where it is a beautiful fall day and I'm okay. I'm okay. It's it feels like it's like September ninety fifth, um, but it's it like almost right. November. It's like almost November now, right? And I just can't believe it. And uh, but it. Somebody posted we've been in twenty nineteen for two years now, and that that's just what it feels like. This is so far the longest year I have ever had. So I'm glad I'm not alone in that. Uh, Antonia Delgado, staffing our tech deck over in Delaware. How are you? I am here. I am just constantly surprised by Facebook. Delaware is, um, I don't know, I haven't been outside since like 1.30 this morning. It was nice then. I think the sun must have come up. Days still happen. So I'm pretty good. <laughs> Thank you for asking. And where can we find you on Twitter and well, Facebook now, yay. Me? <laughs> yeah, I'm um, Antonia Bell Delgado, seminarian on Facebook. I am Antonia Bell Delgado, the seminarian. And you'll be watching Instagram. On the view, I mean, getting comments. <laughs> I am now. <laughs> yeah, I will be talking to you through CLF. I'm the one that's so witty and fun. And I will Always. get your questions to our panelists. This is gonna be a great, show. I just like to take a moment and pause for you to look at just how wonderful we all are. Michael Tino, Kiana Perkins, Amanda Weatherspoon, and Aisha. Whoa, whoa. How's her? She gets her last name. All right, I've taken up a lot of time, so <laughs> here we go. <laughs> and Christina Rivera is um, stuck at the Division of Motor Vehicles and hopefully will be joining us soon. Pray uh, for her. Pray, pray. For her. pray. So, uh, and, and I think Meg yeah. Riley is at a CLF uh, board meeting today. Yes. So let's send yes. our love to the CLF board who uh, who make all this fun possible. Absolutely. Excellent. <laughs> and donate to CLF. They have yes, amazing please. ministries. Just hit the donate button. Um, <clears throat> before we get to our amazing guests, we do a UU roundup on what's going on in UU world. So I, I must, must give a shout out to seminarian Sarah Skotchko from the Eugene Unitarian Universalist Church. She uh, wrote and uh, uh, told a story that you can find on YouTube on the very nice spider and the angry ladybug. And it is a, an allegory, a metaphor, a fairy tale. I'll jump in here, folks, about- A, a parable, yeah. I think, maybe. Parable, that's the word I was looking for and it wasn't quite in my head because I showered this morning. So all my smart thoughts just went out in my head. Um, so yeah, a parable of what I would call, let's see, uh, nice, uh, you know, the, the politics of nice and how this spider is, is a nice spider, eats bugs still. Um, but talks about how nice he is and the angry ladybug is seen it. So jump in there, anybody else who's seen it and I highly recommend it. And also watch her sermon from, from that same service too, I highly recommend. So anybody else have thoughts on that beautiful? Uh, and, and also Amanda and Kiana jump in. I just wanna say that uh, shout out to Meatville Lombard Theological School for just continuing the excellence that it is, Sarah. Oh my gosh, it was, it was so well crafted. Um, I have a thing for story for all ages being something that everyone can take with them, but also being, not just being thrown together, something that really speaks to, to, I'm sorry, my dog has his new toy. So he is just gonna squeak his little life away with his platypus. I could tell him to stop, but he won't. <laughs> It's just, it just really speaks to so many things in our lives and especially to Unitarian Universalism as it is right now. I, you definitely check out Sarah uh, Scotchco. 
And speaking of uh, Meadville Lombard, I think their new president's inauguration is uh, this weekend or next. It's pretty soon, right? It's Saturday. Saturday. Dr. Elias so, Ortega Aponte, or Aponte Ortega. I always mix it up. So welcome and congratulations and blessings upon his, uh, his leadership at that school. Amen. And the Blue Symposium is next week. It's sold out. You could still watch it online, but the on-site registrations are all sold out. And after that is Laredo. So we got a lot of great and, things coming up. And the view will be broadcasting live from, from the Blue Symposium That's next right. week, right? Um, I, I will be not there. So I will be joining you on Facebook Live to participate in the conversation there because I'm watching the symposium uh, virtually. Yay. <laughs> That's what I was going to chime in and say. If uh, registration is closed, however, there is the live stream is available. Um, if you go to the blue page, the po public open face page, um, you can definitely purchase it. It's $15 for the six sessions right now. But if you wait, if you like get all hesitant and then you wait, then it's going to cost you more money. So just invest the 15 now, get it all set up, and then you don't got to worry. And you can just pop in to the six sessions next week. Just get it done. That's right. Worst case scenario, it's worth giving Blue fifteen dollars, right? <laughs> I wasn't gonna mention it, but yeah. <laughs> so let's jump right in. I also need to name that Kiana Perkins is one of our our star top fans of the View. Uh, Kiana, you're on every week. We can count on you to be enthusiastic and have thoughtful questions and comments. So we want to honor you and give you a shout out. Um, and I'm going to introduce you now. Kiana Perkins is a Minneapolis native that she, she wandered into U Unitarian Universalism back in the early 2000s when she took a job as the youth coordinator for Unity Summer. And in 2010, 2010 after moving to Ann Arbor, she joined First UU Congregation of Ann Arbor with Reverend, Reverend Gail Geisenheimer in 2017. On a new quest, she found Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism and recommitted to this faith. Kiana recently took on the former role of Social Justice Pastoral Care Coordinator at the Ann Arbor Congregation, and she spends her time between on-site congregational work and volunteering for Blue on Team Sankofa. Kiana is also the parent of two tweens who might be Unitarian Universalists one day. Yay! And the Reverend Amanda Weatherspoon currently serves River Road Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Bethesda, Maryland as the Minister for Justice and Community Building, a ministry that allows her to engage justice, social justice issues with a spiritual and faith-based grounding rooted in service, spirit, and community. I would actually love to start there because one of my pet peeves in our UU spaces is those who say, I really want more spirituality and less social justice as if they're, they're in any way different or in any, to me. I mean, I'm, so I would love for each of you to speak to that. It's also the opposite is true. I want more social justice and less spirituality. And like, so there's two parts to my role. It's part social justice uh, minister and it's also part community building minister. Um, and what I learned that when I started there, this is a brand new position. They've always had an assistant minister, but um, when the former assistant minister decided to move on, they created this portfolio. And so I'm the first to embody it. And there's a, already a strong social justice structure in our congregation, but the community building piece was really the, you know, build that from scratch kind of thing. And what I learned after a year of doing it was the community building needed to happen within the social justice structure. Um, and it's so easy to silo. It's so easy to forget that we are doing this as part of a faith community, as hard as that is for some you use to accept, like this is a faith community and um, there is some grounding to what we do and community can be the grounding to it. Connection can be the grounding. But that was something, that was one of the many lessons that I learned over just one year of doing it through observation and, and digging into the job. So yeah, it does work both ways. I want less spirituality, more social justice, or more social justice, less spirituality. But they are both. And I think the combination of justice and spirituality is liberation. 
Um, that's something I would totally snap at if I was like watching and not um, participating today. I'm like, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, my job title is really interesting and I think it covers the spectrum that you're talking about. So I am the social justice and pastoral care coordinator. Um, and I very beginning, I was like, I could do the social justice in my sleep. I'll figure out the pastoral care. But I had to spend some time trying to figure out why these two were together or who would put these two things together. But the truth of the matter is pastoral care is how we take care of each other and social justice is how we're, we uh, take care of the world. So if we are not taking care of us, we cannot take care of the world. We can yeah. choose to do one or the other, but if we can do both in balance, that's absolutely the, the preference. Um, and you might, you know, it's a scale. You might need some more heart movement to do the justice of bringing your 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 con your fellow congregant a lasagna that might be your your form of justice but you have to do both um i think and i talked about this a little bit last night in another space it's really easy to do a lot of handwork which i think like giving money is handwork to me right and it's way out here but when we can do hand and heart work it makes a lot of difference um and i don't i'm not saying you can't give us money I'll take your money, but know that I'm going to use it in a hand and heart way, right? <laughs> so you do, you do what you need to do, but I'm going to always put the two together. If you need to separate them so you can give me money or give me a resource or give me your time, I, I'm, we're, I'll, I'll stay in my lane, which is to be activated in my heart core, my God core, and my faith core to do what's right. Yeah. And I, I love that you said hand and heart work because something that I started that came up in my sermons over and over again was that there's no social justice that happens outside of these walls. It doesn't happen here first. Uh, if we are, how we treat each other matters, how we are in this community matters. And it is the building blocks of what we're able to do in the world. I really think that faith communities are learning labs. Um, one of the things is that we're learning labs for how we live our lives. And if we are at each other, and I mean, this happens in a lot of, this happens in every congregation. If we are not treating each other well, we can't really be about doing justice outside of our walls. It's got to start with us. So I love, I love Kiana that you said hand and heart work. It's, it goes hand in hand. <laughs> the other piece I wanted to point out, and I think it's important is, although we, did you start in like August of 2018? About September, yeah. So we both have these kind of same, you know, titles. One of the interesting things is I'm not ordained. I am not a minister. And so the way that I do the work that I do is a little bit different. And I don't have the, the, the power of the pulpit per se. I don't get to stand in that medium to communicate my message. So there, there is a difference. Um, and I'm just sharing that to say, the way folks engage ministers, because we have that, you know, you're a minister, is very different than how folks approached me because I wasn't ordained. It was like, okay, what are you up to? Like, how are you valid? Like, a lot of that, like, UUism really wraps around um, academic or very heady, um, you know, markers, indication of success or indicators of intelligence. And because I don't have those three letters in front of my name, I have to push a little bit harder sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and that is really interesting because I think, so something I'm working on is um, I'm going to put a proposal in for GA, General Assembly, around talking about social justice ministry, because I think there's a lot of things that congregations need to realize when they embark on either having a coordinator or a minister, and that is the pushback that will inevitably happen. I mean, there's a lot, but, you know, Kiana, there's, that just kind of reminded me of this one point of kind of the authority question and there is a habit not a habit there's you know there's kind of a pattern that we see with congregations wanting to hire younger people of color to do social justice ministry um, and it's really important to be very clear about what you're doing and who you're what what you're putting people into um, because a lot of the social justice issues so to speak rest at our intersections. So you're asking us to come into these congregations and to do work around and to lead people and work around these issues. And you have to understand that 
we are undergoing the same kinds of things and still trying to lead people. And it's just, it's a consideration that is more than a consideration when you're looking at setting up social justice ministry or continuing social justice ministry coordination. You've got to put supports in place for us. Because I, I, inevitable push. I don't think that, I would. Oh. No, no, go on. <laughs> I don't think I would have taken this job had there not been other staff of color here. Um, I just wouldn't have, uh, just for my own mental health, my own sanity. Um, but because there is support here, I've been able not just to be here, which I could have done easily, but I'm thriving here. And the ministries and the work that I'm doing are thriving because I have support. Um, we, as you use, have a tendency to want to sometimes hire brown folks because that feels like the thing to do, but we give them no support, um, no direction, no, uh, all of the things that we do when we, when we hire brown folks but don't support brown folks. And so, um, again, I would not be in this space if I was not supported um, because I, I wouldn't have made it a year. I just yeah. wouldn't have. That was the workshop I did at GA last year was beyond hiring because we want to hire people of, with marginalized identities and then just, that's all, you know, and it doesn't work out that way to, to truly be inclusive and to be beyond diversity and beyond just the hiring. Um, there, I, I think we make things super complicated in UU spaces and progressive spaces. We make things really abstract. And I think it's, it's actually very practical if you look at basic tenets of making this work and it is trust, trust to do our jobs. Like you hired us for a reason. We have, we have, we are qualified. So trust and support, <laughs> trust and support. Um, and it's going to look differently. Me and my supervisor, who's also, she's a senior minister and we have a great relationship. We often say work harder and work differently. That's what it requires. That's what this requires. I'm the first black minister this congregation has ever had. We have to work harder and work differently. We can't just do the same thing. And that is, that was kind of the crux of the beyond hiring panel discussion and which Manish was on um, was the imperative that you can't bring people of color or people with marginalized identities into these spaces and do the same thing and think that they're gonna somehow thrive because it's you now <laughs> like, because we're the ones doing it. It's like, this is an abstract. This is all of us. We all create these systems. And so it, it's just, it, it's an interesting, you know, the one thing I want to tell congregations or groups who have social justice ministries or want to create them is be prepared for the work within the work, the labor within the labor. It's not just about, it's not just about coordinating programming. It's an entire systematic shift. And that is, that is you have to do it differently. It, the same things are gonna work. Maybe some of them will. And, and that's a hard pill to swallow. Um, I am smiling and, and blinking and thinking about relationship and intersection and how um, when I first started or more probably recently, Linda, uh, Reverend Linda Susan said, you know, being in relationship and being in community is, is in your water. It's how you're going to function. Um, and I think some of that is in, in genuine, like who I am, but I think 10% of it is like CYA and trying to be transparent. Um, and it's a protective mechanism at some level because I do get so anxious that I'm going to do that one thing that, you know, or all of these things that come with being a brown person in a predominantly white space that I, you know, picked up you know, from college and from a lot of, you know, life stuff. Um, and I realize I'm carrying some of that energy with me and it's less after a year, but it definitely, there's a different amount of energy that I'm, I feel like uh, that I'm giving out or have to balance constantly um, around protecting myself as a brown person who's experiencing the intersections that Amanda was talking about, because those run through me, right? When we talk about interweave, which is our GLBT group, I can be in that group. When we talk about the women's group, I can be in that group. When we talk about doing stuff for the poor people's campaign for housing, I could go be at that protest and be a recipient of services for housing. So because those intersections are always there, um, I'm carrying that extra weight sometimes and it's hard. Um, 
it's it can be really hard to bring my full self here to help folks fight for justice when I'm struggling with some of those same realities or some of those same um, issues out in the world. Um, when I leave this building, this little bubble pops the moment my car hits, you know, the street. <laughs> well, one of the things I, one of the things I've experienced um, because it, so I am now a part of my role intentionally as director of lifelong learning and social justice after the teaching. Um, because I, my role with that, and, and what, I, what I tell, one of the things that I, because the journey is the destination, so speaking to what you both are saying, and Amanda, what you're saying about, you know, if we don't have our house in order, we're not going to be able to really, um, in a substantive way, impact social justice in the world, and so what I, so, so one of the critiques or criticisms that, or, or things that I've heard in the congregation about me, me personally as well, um, she has a hidden agenda, or she's, it's one thing to, to, to uh, give me a review or say, here are the things about your job that you're not doing well. That's fine. The part that's racist that I educate white folks on is the suspicion. It's somehow like there's the suspicion. What's your motivation? You're trying to take over. I'm like, take over what? Like, <laughs> I would aim higher. Thank you very much. Like, I would not try to take over a white UU church. Like, I'm um, <laughs> just, so that's the part that I try. I know I said that in my out loud voice, right? So um, to me, the, the part of the social justice piece is to remove that suspicion. Because look what happened with Obama, right? He wasn't born here. He wasn't legitimate. So if we can teach our folks in our spaces, especially white liberals who think, you know, they think great, is your suspicion of me as a, a staff of color and, and a person who's here for the same reason you are to, to a, affirm Unitarian Universalism, that's racist. That's where racism is showing up, is, is this underlying suspicion what are you doing here what's your motivation and um and that's that's compelling and an important piece and the journey is the destination we're doing it all the time it's so hard to do what you just said Aisha and you know it's because I one of the things I've been saying a lot lately is until our folks see themselves in this they're going to keep thinking it's about somebody else they're going to keep thinking always those folks need to be less blank. Um, and there's a culture and ministry that I'm beginning to unpack that is very much so pacify people, um, kind of, you know, take the hit, take the hit. Um, apologize when you haven't done anything or kind of let people's bad behavior run the show. That is. That is a thing in ministry, especially you use because of our non-authoritarian thing. It's a really weird uh, conundrum with Unitarian Universalism that we're so anti-authoritarian and yet we don't want, we want someone else to do the work. It's, it's, it's really weird. But um, there is a kind of thing I've been noticing in ministry. The ministers who succeed have done that because that system benefits them. And I'm talking about mostly white ministers they can take those hits and they can take the blame and they can apologize when they haven't done anything because their identity, they, they're pri they have privilege of being able to shake that off. People with marginalized identities are already told in so many ways their whole lives um, how less worthy they are, how less intelligent they are, how they, their problems are theirs and they're, they're the reason, right? So when we come to work and we get that, I'm personally, I'm like, I'm not starting off my career by taking a bunch of hits from people who were twice my age. Now I'm starting. <laughs> uh, let me rewind this and say, I'm not taking hits for things I didn't do. And I think it's important that we not perpetuate in ministry, um, allowing bad behavior to run the show. And it's really hard not, it's hard to say that's racism. It's really hard to do that because of the, the fragility. Well, the, and the fragility will steal the show. And white supremacy culture depends on suppressing conflict in order to perpetuate itself, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, if, if I'm taught as a minister, oh, just make them feel better, apologize, right? Um, right then what I'm doing is perpetuating white supremacy culture. And as a Nothing white person, has to change. right. If I do that as a white person, like I don't get torn down by that. 
I don't, I don't, I don't get attacked by that. If I'm perpetuating white supremacy culture, I'm a white person. So I'm just getting upheld by that. Um, but and, you can't do that. Well, and, and the, the person with the marginalized identity cannot be the one to always be saying it. This is, this is right. where it gets, you have to have a support structure in place because you can't be the only one saying this is a racist system, not because you all are racist, but because everything's a racist system. Like we see in a larger picture of Unitarian Universalism and the wider world, that narrative has been twisted. You know, and so when we say like, this is a system, we're all swimming in these waters, we're all culpable, some are privileged, some are marginalized, right? Um, that is twisted when a, when a person with a marginalized identity says it right now, like the climate that we're in. It cannot just be us. There has to be support in place. And I'm, I feel very fortunate in my congregation that I have that support in a lot of ways and it's still challenging. Like I, the people who came before us and the people who are right now working, people of color don't necessarily, I mean, a lot of us are probably on the, of the Facebook group for religious professionals of color constantly, constant. Um, the, the things that people go through to serve this denomination. Uh, it's, I think it's amazing. I wanted to, I wanted to say, um, I have been in my congregation, I think this is my seventh week as an, um, an intern minister. And I had an experience, and I'm trying to keep it, um, trying not to be able to identify the thing. But I had an experience where I thought someone was new to a situation, so they were seeking power, and I was the one, even though I'm intern minister, that was there sooner. So they did a thing because they were seeking the power of this situation. And I, I said it to my minister, who is a white woman, and she said, no, that was racism. That, that wasn't about like a power dynamic of this person doesn't have as much power in the room as that person. She's like, no, that was racism and that was silencing. And I'm glad that you said something about it. And it does take, for me, I'm constantly trying to navigate like, because we know that in our congregations, there are a lot of power struggles too. So is this about just the power in this group? Is this about racism? Could this be about my trans identity? Is this about all of these things, all of these identities that we carry? And um, so it took me a minute to unpack that, even though it was about, it took, <laughs> it's just weird that racism wasn't the thing that came to me first, because there are all these other things that are also very harmful. And, and I don't want to be the person that's like, you know, this is racist and that is racist because then they're like, oh, Antonia, you know, she's one of those black people or she's one of those black people. And I'm okay being one of those black people if that's who I need to be to you for you um, to be okay. <laughs> before we came on screen, one of the things that we were talking about is how melanated today's episode is. And um, it made me want to ask all of the three of you, sorry, Michael, we're not centering you. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, so, so we talk about ministerial, you know, identity and what that means, and I'm grappling with that and all of the ways one does that, but how do we engage faith, a predominantly white faith, as people of color, Black, Indigenous, POC folks? Um, what do you say to somebody who's maybe interested in ministry? Because I, I get excited about it, and I'm absolutely petrified for a lot of reasons, but I I, I just, I, I have the space and y'all said I could ask whatever I wanted to ask, so I'm asking. So I'm not a minister. I'm a religious educator and right now I'm in credentialing. Um, I, look at Kiana, <laughs> getting all surprised. <laughs> you didn't know I was in a minister? I am not a rev, no, I- uh, You're my people. <laughs> I am your people. I'm a religious, and I, I intend, so I did, so I've been doing this 15, 16 years. Um, and several, especially in the beginning, as soon as I showed any, like, I have a pulse and I speak well, oh, go to seminary, go to seminary. And I'm like, <laughs> and I looked into it. And for me, and I, and I definitely came close a couple times, but then I realized, okay, it was actually my, my, my white husband who said to me, what are you doing that you can't do? And I'm like, huh? uh, I'm like, oh, not much. Really. I mean, I don't, I don't have the calling of being in the pulpit every week. I love being an educator. 
So once credentialing happened and I just said, you know what, I love religious leadership. This is something that is I do and I'm, a, and I'm called to do. And so this is not, a, I love and affirm every single person who went through the ordination process. And for me, I made the assessment that I do not think that process affirms who we say we being Unitarian Universalists want to be in the world. That was my assessment. It doesn't mean I'm right. That was just simply for me, like, oh, I'm going to do, and I had an option too. Maybe if there wasn't a religious education credentialing option, um, because there is merit to what everyone has been saying about you, you need the creds. There's some, there is merit to the idea that our folks um, appreciate the creds. And so maybe if I had no other option, I would have ended up by default going to seminary, but I did have another option and I love being a religious educator. So that's my answer. I, I would just say the same thing what we're saying for social justice ministry in our congregations, which is have your house in order. I mean, the amount of work I have to put into my own self to do this is absolutely necessary. Um, and I mean, even in getting into seminary, so much unravels. I mean, that's the case with any life transition. And um, ministry, so I have a executive coach as we call it, it's, it's Julica um, and she's amazing and we love her and she works with me one-on-one -on -one, and she works with me and the senior minister together. Uh, this, that's only part of the effort we put into having a multiracial team. But um, something she says that is so uplifting to me is that ministry is first and foremost for you. And ministry can be healing for you first and foremost. Like all of this crap, all the challenges, all the difficulties can be healing because you are getting to center yourself in the grace of ministry. You're getting to center yourself in Unitarian Universalism because this is for all of us. This is for every single one of us. And it's, it doesn't have to be a power struggle. It doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be a struggle at all, but it will be challenging because healing is. So that's kind of, I mean, in terms of going into ministry, um, I agree with you, Aisha, there should be a lot of different avenues for credentialing and education. Um, and, you know, a lot of people, everyone, it comes down to a personal choice in terms of what kind of letters you want or what kind of, you know, I'm the kind, I was on a path to be a therapist before I was doing this. It was important to me to have credentials of some sort. Like I had just my whole life, was really wanting to be, you know, a, you know, marriage and family therapist, like some kind of degree and credential. So that's why I went that path, right? That's just who I am. So um, there should be a lot of opportunities, but in terms of ministry in general, any kind of credential ministry, um, it can be and is very healing. I mean, even without the credentials, but I mean, I could not do this without the level of intense inner process that it takes to be in our situation. I'm still baking, I'm in seminary. I'm not fully baked yet. <laughs> um, I just wanna say amen to everything that Amanda said. I, um, I was a social worker, uh, I'm in MSW. Uh, so, hey girl. And so um, I did social work for almost 20 years and I loved every bit of it, but I knew that I had a calling and that for me, that calling was really important to pursue. Um, I found that there was something missing for me in doing social work. There was a spiritual connection that I couldn't, I didn't have the, the I didn't know how to connect in that way without being harmful to someone or without you know trampling on their own belief systems and I needed to learn how to do that for me because that's my primary connection to people is spiritual and I needed to learn how to do it because I believe that that's my it's it's why I'm here that that's my gift for the world that's that's what I'm here for and I needed to do it for my grandfather who was an itinerant preacher and he sold peanuts his whole life my father's father and he lived in Mississippi and he wasn't able to do the schooling to be 
a minister and I needed to do it for my father who is a, a minister in um, science of mind and he was able to and so part of it is that my family is a family that is of service they're social workers police officers teachers ministers and so I, I think I thought it was important for me to pass that generational uh, piece on too. I also want to add a caveat. I haven't looked at the process in over 10 years. So it, it, what my understanding, especially Meadville, and I understand uh, Star King, actually both of our UU seminaries are represented on this show, um, have changed. And they're not a lot more, um, well, my understanding is applicable. They're, they're, they're more, I guess, um, I was about to say reality-based, which is not nice. That's not <laughs> what I meant. But, I, but so, the, so the process may be more, like if I looked at it again, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to seminary, but if, if I did, it may be more appealing in a way it wasn't 10 years ago for me. So I would say that's also true. People seem much more, I took a seminary course actually for my credentialing and I loved it. I loved it more than I thought I would. So there's that. So I think there is a lot of creativity and actually Julika it did, uh, didn't get an MDiv and has an MSW. I have one too. And is going a different process. So I think there's a lot of creative ways, Kiana, to, to um, go on the journey, which is, which I think is great, which is a gift. You're muted. You're still muted. I know I was thinking that I was, couldn't press the button. Um, <laughs> um, I wanna thank you all for sharing that. Uh, as a person who's doing this, as a lay person who's, like life is dedicated to social justice because like I wake up and like I'm already like I'm a reason somebody has like a lawn sign you know what I mean like I'm the reason somebody's voting for Bush, like Bush and Trump and all of that wonderfulness um isn't that weird that I just said Bush when I meant Trump so I wanted to say the way that we something that I'm getting really nurtured in um in a really beautiful sideways is um, the intersection of things. So like I'm going to the Loretta conference. I'm not a religious educator, but I need education to be a part of all the things that I do. We have to educate folks about pastoral care and about end of life decisions and transition processes and memory care loss. We have to educate folks about what bail is. And so even, the, so even though social justice and pastoral care is what I, you know, walked in the door doing, there is so much more I'm capable of doing. I've been empowered to do it, but also I'm getting to see how all of these disciplines can work together um, and they have to work together, that we can't be in a silo, that as much as I need to be in a relationship with the nearest clinic, if somebody needs that support, I need to be in relationship with the people in this community who maybe do water justice so that I can direct somebody when they say they want to do something here, whatever the case is, but this constant revolving relationship, this constant engagement, um, it's not like spiritual growth and development's over there and social justice is over here. They have to be together. They have to be happening. Um, we have to think of lifelong learners. We have to think of, you know, how do we help the grandmas who might be maybe now are having to parent younger kids? How do we support those folks? How do we support young families who are just walking in the door? How do we support young queer trans families who are looking for spiritual space? So I think the more we enter the more we honor intersections, the more we honor all the voices that live in that intersection, the better we become. And I'm hoping that that filters out and keeps going and going and going. Um, it's just imperative, I think. Uh, it, for you, you to thrive and survive, we have to integrate more intersected voices. Yeah, and, and you know, with ministry, not just ordained ministers, but I use ministry Probably because like, for example, my mom was the first minister I knew and she's, she's a chemical engineer, right? She, but she's been doing prison ministry my whole life, right? So ministry is very visionary too. I think that that is something that for me, a struggle is not to get so in the weeds of what our lay leaders are doing, but to also be looking at the vision. Um, th like that is why you would, one would hire a social justice minister, like, which is not so, uh, one of the things we're talking about in that workshop is that congregations need to be very clear on what they're wanting, but like, you know, you can have a minister who does the coordination of the programming. You can have a minister who's the face of social justice on the outside. 
You can have a minister who is working on systemic things within the congregation. Those are three different jobs. And you can do an amalgamation of them, but to do any one of them fully, you can only do one, right? It, the, the, the expectations need to be set around that. Um, but all of those require some kind of visionary aspect and some looking at the bigger picture and understanding how you want to move these systems, the intersections, the future of Unitarian Universalism, what social justice is becoming, how it's transforming, how church and congregational life is transforming. You know, those are things that we, if we get so fixated on the weeds, as important as those weeds are, we, we are not able to really move our congregations towards their vision and mission, you know. Um, and that's, that's something that's very important in ministry. Like uh, one of the things I loved about seminary is it gives you an opportunity to dig into all of this. You know, this, it gives you an opportunity, um, especially with the Star King, which is a part of a larger consortium of an interfaith schools. Um, so it gives you this chance to dig into all of that. Also, that was when I uh, realized and started identifying as a spiritual humanist. Um, that was when I found liberation theology, womanist theology, like these ways of looking at this bigger picture, engaging a bigger structure. And then so when we go into the working world, we take that knowledge with us. And seminary is not the only place to get that by any means, but that is the knowledge. That is what we need to be able to look at building a new way. And not that there's anything with all, wrong with the old way. I mean, hashtag there is, but like, it's not that we have to leave everything behind. But visionary, that's a big part of ministry. Um, the, the sections of ministry that the fellowshipping committee wants us to fit, focus on, there's different ones. And one of them is leads the faith into the future. That is one of the things because we have to be visionary as ministers and our congregants and the work of it will pull us into the weeds. And it's hard. It's hard to get out of that. Oh. But we got to figure out a way. Kiana? I don't, I don't want to forget this, and I tried to write it down, and I forgot because I was listening to you so hard. One of the things that Reverend Manish um, has kind of instilled in us, I think, I hope as a staff, it's instilled in me, is that this is a congregation-led congregation. And so it's really, so this work could have been very hard. We're a larger church. We have about 1,000 members. Um, we have over 20 social justice groups. We have just about 20 spiritual and social connection groups. So, you know, we're not playing around. And some of the boundary and the balance I've been able to maintain is to really asking folks in these congregations to own the work. So like, I'm a coordinator. I am flight control. I make sure no planes hit each other. I can tell you where the black box is when things go down. Um, but I am not doing your work because if we hire folks, this is where it comes from. If we hire folks in these roles, no matter what color they are, um, we're, we're here, but we're not here to do the work. And when we start to separate the work from other, from congregant spiritual experience, they become disconnected. Everything becomes transactional. It puts the money out here. So if you, so like, for example, like a group will write me and say, oh, we have this great presentation on, you know, the, the, crisis, the uh, Flint water crisis. I'm not going to set that up. I'm not reserving the room. I'm not vetting you. I call the folks in charge of climate change and say, climate change, you take this on. Do you have the capacity? Um, and then they decide if they have the capacity to do that. But I, I share that to say, being really clear about what roles are is so important. Um, but also realizing if we do all the work, then they don't do the work and guess what? Their spirituality doesn't grow. Their faith doesn't grow. Their connection to the physical building they're in, the community they, they serve doesn't grow. And so it's imperative that even though we are in these roles as social justice coordinators, our minister, that we still have boundaries and we still have respect for ourselves and the work that has to get done and the mm -hmm. delicate nature that comes with serving and it being tied to your faith. It's a very thin spider web that I think we know exists, but people act like it doesn't. Like, no, you need to be connected to this labor. Um, yeah. To heal yourself, to be, to be in this community. Yeah, yeah. I uh, could not agree more with that. Because if we take, if, like, that's what I was saying about being clear about why you want a social justice minister coordinator. You want someone just to take on the work and be the face of it. Well, 
guess what? I mean, what's the reason for that? What is the purpose for that? Um, once again, is it to make you feel good? Because a social justice minister, especially if there hasn't been one before, ain't going to make you feel good. It's just, that's the nature of social justice that we have to just accept because it is an indictment on all of us. And it's not the most feel good things. I try to be very empower empowering in my message. I use my sermons to be empowering and to draw, you know, conclusions around what's going on in our community, et cetera. But the work during the week is anything but. <laughs> and and that's the thing. I mean, that's the balance is that um, it's important for people to be clear why they need it. And they also got to step up. And that's really hard. That is hard for people. It's hard to say to people too. <laughs> it's hard to say. Mike, Michael, do you want to read some of the comments, but also just to give people that 10 minute yeah, so we're we're gonna stay a couple a couple minutes extra today, because uh, we started late. We we were having technical difficulties, so please stay with us for another ten minutes. We have a a vibrant conversation happening on Facebook, and Antonia is doing uh zer zer best to get everything into into here. Um, and I I'm trying to scroll back to get everything that everybody is saying. Um. Let's see, Marie Porter Manning wants to lift up the UU Society for Community Ministries uh, and the work that they do helping uh, people doing community uh, ministries who are not necessarily ordained clergy folks. Um, Linda Susan Ulrich is, is on here and has a bunch of comments. Uh, Linda Susan says, see also preachers write the sermons that they need to hear, um, which I love and it's totally true. Um, and a uh, friend of the show, Ty Resendez de Perez, uh, has a couple comments in here too. Uh, Ty writes, Jesus didn't come for the saved. Those who devote their careers to faith work do so because they need or want faith work. And also um, that we need to talk seriously about the fact that for those who pursue faith work as a career, the salary difference between being a minister, uh, being an ordained clergy person and other professional roles in our faith is huge. And how many people, especially uh, people of color, choose that ordained pathway over being a music minister or a DRE or a social justice director um, because it's the choice that allows for financial stability and survival. Um, and Janine Gelsinger, also friend, friend of the show and regular viewer, um, followed that up with um, how many people can't pursue ministry because the financial and time cost of seminary is not accessible. And it's, that's a huge, huge thing. And especially for, you know, just how, you, how much you have to pay seminary, how much time you have to take out of other things, the financial reality of doing an internship and the way that we treat uh, interns in our congregation, um, it's, it's every, every time somebody says, oh, you should go to school. You know what I say to them? Do you have a scholarship for black queer women? And they just look at me. I'm like, well. <laughs> well, and even if they had a scholarship to pay your tuition, like you can pay my rent and, you know, feed well, my I children. Got some magic <laughs> I mean, I got a bad. I mean, I'm just saying, I, um, I got some tricks up my sleeve, but you take care of that chunk. Mama will work out the rest. I'm a hustler all day long. <laughs> Apply to Meville Lombard. Meville Lombard does have scholarships. I tried to get it in before Amanda started talking about Star King. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing, y'all. Y'all, whoever, y'all got about three to four years to woo me. I'm not going too far too fast, so I'm gonna be here. Um, I think the other thing I wanted to talk about is building relationships. Um, in a lot of communities of color, uh, the way that, so I'll use my own life for example. The way I knew how to get anything done or go anywhere, or the way I know how to navigate is through people. So when we were younger, I couldn't tell you who the cable company was. I knew this crackhead who climbed the pole for $40 and we had cable. I'm not saying it was legal. I'm saying it's how we did things. When you got sick, what you didn't do, you didn't go to the hospital, you went and got some Vicks and some uh, Verners and some crackers and you watched Price is Right. And the woman who watched kids all day wasn't a licensed daycare. She didn't cross them eyes and dot them T. She was an old lady who made sure your kids didn't get beat and fed them so you could go to work that day. And so the way that we approach community is so different. And I think even that is like a like, R -r -r. it isn't transactional. You haven't, you've paid me to be here, but you, you, 
are paying for so much more than that. You know what I mean? Like, I know how to make things happen in community and connection. And I can tell you, I don't even live in Minneapolis, but I can tell you five places to cash a check without having a bank account right now. I can name two in Ypsilanti, if I had to. You know what I mean? So that idea of hustle and working around things, I think sometimes for folks who are very scripted and very to the book and very cross my I's, dot my T's, and like, don't like my grandma didn't have a, a degree, but when you walk by her window, you said, hello, Miss Bonnie, if you wanted to keep your life. So I think those ways of interacting and engaging are something that as we see this, not an influx of POC, because we've been here. I've been working on that. We've been here as we are going through a phase of acknowledging how much black indigenous people of color realities have been in in, in UU spaces we're starting to realize that the way that brown folks connect and create community is so different. Um, I've just started to launch multicultural ministry here in terms of really it's kind of um, black congregants and then the POC and eventually they will become some version of blue and some version of drum, um, but we're not there yet. And the way those communities connect, come together, have conversation and talk is radical compared to like being in a room and being like, we all read this book. Let's talk about the book. And we sitting in the room like, look, what you cooked last week, just there's a, just a different energy. So I'm excited to be bringing that energy and that way of relating and being in relationship into spaces because it's critical. It's how we're getting things done. Well, and it seems, it seems so much um, of what we started talking about in terms of the jobs that you do and the different portfolios that you have. So Amanda, you were talking about community building and social justice and Kiana, you were talking about pastoral care and social justice and so much of that to me boils down to the connections there are how we engage in real relationship with one another, with people outside our walls, with people inside our walls, it's real relationship and what it means to heal relationship when it's broken and what it means to, to stay in relationship. Um, we have more, we have more comments that, I, we can we can leave for but I want, I, yeah i know i, I want to i want to say something hard thing too because um internalized oppression is real and we have some of our beloved folks and our i mean religious professionals of color we're not all on the same page and i think some of the most painful interactions i've had and thankfully they haven't been the majority by any stretch of the imagination and the few that I've had that have been, um, it's not even about negative, but just simply not, it's almost, it's almost like, don't upset, you know, the apple cart, like, don't, you're, you're doing, you know, you're doing too much too fast, or why are you upsetting people? Why are you, and, and this is from our folks, from our community, and that's the heart, that was probably one of the, I had a, a person of finding our way home come up to me and say, you know, the words, white supremacy are very hard for me. I said, yeah, they're hard for me too. Isn't it terrible? Isn't white supremacy awful? But this was a person of color who was saying this to me. And I'm like, I have to have this conversation here. And I do, but that's also a reality that I just want to name. That, that's hard. That, that's, a, that's, you know, how do we invite our own folks into um, dismantling the, the water we're swimming in and, and internalized? I work on it all the time. Internalized oppression, internalized misogyny, internalized transphobia. And that's, that's real as well. I uh, feel Harriet, like Tubman. Harriet Tubman say it, said, you know, I would have saved many more if they knew they were slaves. Mm. And um, that's something I work on all the time. It took me so long to become a blue beloved because I was like, ooh, they're Malcolm and I'm trying to be Martin over here. Let me just get, um, let me just go ahead and get ordained before I get off into this. And I realized, it's not gonna make a difference. I will not be any less black. I will not be any less clear. I will not be any less female bodied because it's, it's about what people think of me, not about anything else. So I can be Malcolm, I can be Martin. Mm -hmm. I can be any of those people and it's still, still gonna be the thing. So yeah. I feel and like- The question is an everyday thing. Yeah, yeah, I feel like ultimately, our jobs as social justice coordinators or ministers and just in general, Unitarian Universalism is fundamentally a relational faith. Uh, 
our, our, the premise has been to, built on relationality, our polity built on relationality. And it's our, also our biggest growing edge. The intellectualism we, we got, the rationalism we got, blah, blah, blah. We need to learn how to be together, be with each other. And that is not some straightforward thing because there are a lot of dynamics and power differentials that we have to address. There's a lot of ways that we need to call that people with marginalized identities need to come together and support each other and, and, and soothe each other's souls. There's, it's, there's a lot of layers to it but ultimately is the relational aspect. And I feel like as a social justice minister, it is fundamentally relational, at least where my vision is. Um, Cause like I said, at the very beginning of this, my, my foundation of all of this is liberation. I'm, I, I wanna phase out the phrase social justice even because it gets us too much in a transactional mindset. And liberation is about our house and our heart and each other and the systems of the world. So like my personal thing is project get free. That's for Amanda. Project get free, because I can't do my job. I can't live my life. I can't think about a future if I am trapped within traumas and within the systems that tell me I'm not worthy, if I'm not taking care of myself. To me, that's liberation. That's much more important than where I give money to or et cetera, et cetera. Those things don't stop mattering. But my role in them is only possible if I am doing personal liberation. And that's just my personal vision. I mean, for my job, it's not gonna be like that for everyone, but liberation is, is the foundation from which I Taking do. Taking us to church, Amanda. Kiana, well, it's yeah. my full-time job. <laughs> Kiana, do you wanna say one more word? Cause we can just go on another hour. I'm like, oh, can we just keep going, <laughs> Kiana? And then, yeah. and then Go ahead. Um, about that blue light, um, it's how I save my spirit. It's how I do the work that I do. Um, Black Lives Unitarian Universalist, I'm about that. So, and Babies and Bailouts 2020, let me know if you want to know some more because I'm about that life too. Babies and Bailouts. This has been one of my favorite views ever. And I think I've been, I don't know, I don't even know how many hundred. Thank, I just, thank you is not even enough to uh, how much I've been fed by this. I'm gonna listen to it again. Uh, Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism. Mm. Uh, yes, Babies and Bailouts, our church sent money. We got a thank you recently. I was like, this stuff, yep, Blue Beloved. And um, Michael, thank you for being here. <laughs> I almost said thank you for being our token white guy. Um, thank you, Kiana, Amanda, Antonia. I know that was rude, right? I, ex I will repair our relationship after this, Michael. I love you. Um, next week we're at I the love symposium. you too Asia <laughs> we're at the symposium next week thank you everybody thank you all everyone who watched commented questions we'll see you all next week in St. Paul at Black Lives of the Entire Universalism Symposium Be ciao well.